A young single mother with everything to live for Hi, Lindsay. is found dead. I drove it, just killed herself. A case filled with mystery. Where's the gun? Love. Lindsay like the bad boys. And a killer that almost got away with it. On December 8th, 2016, at 1.51 a.m., Anderson Police 911 Dispatch receives a frantic phone call. 911, where's your emergency? <laughs> the caller identifies himself as Aaron Toller. Okay, where, where are you at? Anderson Police Department uniformed officers arrive at the scene. They could see Christmas ornaments and decorations in the living room and throughout the house. Aaron leads first responders to the bedroom where they find the body of 33-year-old Lindsay Wilkins. She is laying on the edge of the bed closest to the door and there is an obvious gunshot wound to her temple with blood all over. Her left hand was in a position as if she had pulled a trigger with her index finger. There were several pills on the floor area near her bed. There was a torn up letter also in the midst of the scattered pills on the floor. Responding officers talk to Aaron who identifies himself as Lindsay's fiance. Aaron told police that he and Lindsay had been fighting a lot. She was depressed and suicidal, and the bickering kept continuing to a point that he just needed some space, so he'd been staying with a coworker. That night, Lindsay went to the coworker's house and they had an argument there, and then she went home and that's when he said that she killed herself. So police went into it believing that it was a suicide. Aaron tells detectives that he decided to check on Lindsay later that night. That's when he found her in the bedroom and immediately called 911. Then he called Lindsay's mother, Jennifer, who rushed to the scene. When she got there, there were police cars with their lights on. Yellow police tape was being put up. She ran up to the house and there was a police officer there with his hands out. Jennifer asked if she, referring to her daughter, is okay. He just shook his head left and right. She asked to see Lindsay, but the officer wouldn't let her go into the house. Jennifer states that this was a horrible night, just like a huge tidal wave from a tsunami just hitting you all at once. As she tries to deal with the unthinkable, Jennifer's concern turns to her eight-year-old granddaughter, Serenity. The first responding officers let Aaron carry her out of the house. Back inside the house, police collect a 9mm silver shell casing from the floor of the bedroom. But it's what they don't find that makes the biggest impact. They can't find a gun. Based on her hand positioning, a weapon should have been very, very close to the body. They assume since Aaron had told them that it was a suicide, it must have fallen after she shot herself and it would have been under the body. But when the deputy coroner arrived, they were able to move the body and they realized there was no gun. So at this point they're thinking, you can't shoot yourself and then have a gun just disappear. If it's a suicide, then where's the weapon? Law enforcement needs to learn everything about Lindsay to determine if she actually committed suicide or something more sinister was afoot. Detectives start by examining Aaron's story and their relationship more closely. Aaron is taken to the station for questioning. In mid-2015, Lindsay met Aaron at the restaurant where they both worked. The attraction was immediate. When she first met Aaron, she was happy. The two loved going horseback riding, kayaking, and camping. By September of 2016, Lindsay and Aaron were engaged. Lindsay's family members state that Aaron was kind and was good with serenity and sweet to Lindsay. I love you. Several years before she met Aaron, Lindsay became pregnant while dating someone else. Serenity was born on July 4, 2008. The father of Serenity was absent by the time she was born. When Serenity was born, it changed Lindsay's life. She wanted to make sure that Serenity had the best life that she could. Her world revolved around her daughter. In researching this case, Lindsay's Facebook had more pictures of her daughter and friends than of herself. With Aaron by her side, it seemed like Lindsay's dream of a family for Serenity was finally coming true. Lindsay loved him and was ready to settle down and have a family. Her family says Lindsay had everything to live for, so in hearing that she had taken her own life, they were skeptical. Down at the station, a detective questions Aaron. What time would you say you got a new house? Um, just a little bit, maybe like a quarter to two almost. Aaron explains again that he and Lindsay had an argument outside of a coworker's house earlier that night. Afterwards, Lindsay went back to her house and Aaron eventually followed her there. You got in the house with her? I got to the doorway to the kitchen and started smelling the gunpowder. So I started to walk into the bedroom. Yeah, and then what? I walked in the room, saw all the pills on the floor, saw all the blood. And I put my hand on her. I yelled, Lindsay, really loud. And I called 911. Okay, the question is, 
Where's the gun? I'm not sure. Did you ever see none of them? No. I saw the bullet casing on the floor. That's it. Do you or her carry any type of weapons to our goons? Um, I don't I don't carry any. But she wanted to die in the house for protection. Aaron told detectives that he had bought a weapon for Lindsay. It's a Glock 22. 40 caliber. That's my own Yes, sir. Aaron tells detectives that he was worried about Lindsay hurting herself, so he hid the gun about three and a half weeks prior in a tree line just north of the backyard of the residence. The detective immediately relayed this information to investigators at the scene. Which side of the fence? Uh, the, the front side. He said the front side. Sure enough, they're led directly to the gun. After recovering the weapon, it was sent off to the Indiana State Police Lab. At the lab, they test the weapon to see if it was the gun used to shoot Lindsay. At some point, they realize that the gun is not the weapon that was used. This makes detectives wonder where the actual murder weapon is. It just didn't make sense. If it was a suicide and it was a self-inflicted gun wound, how could the gun just mysteriously come up missing? There's no gun there, man. Somebody shot her, who did you think? Aaron gives them a name and a motive. Her ex-boyfriend, Sean. He already made threats about killing me and killing Lindsay. He somehow figured out our address. Just tried to sabotage our relationship the whole time because he wants to be with her. Aaron informed detectives of Lindsay's former boyfriend, Sean Hutchins. The name is familiar to police. In fact, the letters torn up at the crime scene were addressed to Sean. There were a lot of letters and notes, so it took detectives some time to put them together. Investigators don't know the contents of the letters just yet, but they immediately discover Sean could not have killed Lindsay. Sean Hutchins was in a local prison serving time for a burglary charge. And when detectives confront Aaron about this, he makes a shocking allegation. He's gonna have some kind of way to get somebody. Aaron informed detectives that Sean Hitchens probably had means of contacting someone that could have had Lindsay killed. Sean was let down on her because she told him that we were getting engaged. He was suggesting that Sean hired someone to kill Lindsay because she didn't love him anymore. Detectives look into Lindsay and Sean and their relationship. Investigators ask Lindsay's family about her relationship with Sean. Lindsay's sister, Simony, says that Sean was not the greatest guy and that she knew that he and Lindsay were not meant for each other. Lindsay liked the bad boys, anyone she could fix. Sean had issues, a lot of issues, and she wanted to be there and help him through those issues. Sean and Lindsay met in 2013 and bonded over the fact that they both had daughters from prior relationships. Hi, Merry Christmas. Serenity was five and Sean's daughter was one. From Santa Claus, huh? What's going to see what's he had a little girl and Lindsay adored that little girl. She was trying to make the family for Serenity that she wanted to make. You read it, Sean? You want to read it? Yes, yes. Okay. But the good times with Sean didn't last. I don't accept it. No. F you. F you. F you don't know me. The relationship took a turn for the worse. He was into drugs. Yeah! And he was very controlling and manipulative. So f you. Lindsay's other sister Haley moved in with Lindsay, Sean, and Serenity in 2014. Sean's behavior got worse. He started stealing from Haley and then started stealing from Lindsay. Haley soon reached her breaking point when he had gotten physical with her. Lindsay tried to break it up and the cops got called. Haley told Lindsay that she couldn't stay there anymore. She told Lindsay that she needed to do what's best for Serenity. A month after Haley and Sean's altercation, Lindsay ended their relationship. But when Lindsay met Aaron in mid-2015, Sean didn't take too well to her moving on with another man. Sean got jealous. He was angry because he felt that he was losing the love of his life. According to Haley, one night he showed up at the local restaurant where Lindsay and Aaron both worked. Sean knew that Lindsay was seeing somebody, but he didn't know exactly who it was. He was yelling, demanding to know who it was and where he was. Aaron stayed out of the situation because Lindsay asked him to. Eventually, Sean left, but his relentless pursuit of Lindsay didn't stop there. Investigators obtained letters and emails Sean sent to Lindsay from prison in the months leading up to her death. Sean Hutchins had been writing to Lindsay, trying to save their relationship. Detectives discover that in some letters, Sean is pleading, and in others, his words are downright disturbing. But they also expose another, more shocking detail. Lindsay was still writing and communicating with Sean, and she kept that from Aaron. Investigators determined that between October 1st and December 5th of 2016, Lindsay and Sean exchanged over 50 letters and emails. 
The letters between her and Sean indicated that he would get out soon so they could continue their love affair. She tried to keep the letters a secret from Aaron for as long as she could. But in the fall of 2016, Aaron intercepted a letter from Sean meant for Lindsay. And that's when their arguing got intense when he found out about her still talking to Sean. Aaron insisted Lindsay stop communicating with her ex, and Sean's letters indicate Lindsay did exactly that. As time passed, the tone of his letters leading up to Lindsay's death became increasingly volatile, revealing a scorned ex who refused to be forgotten. And the ripped up letters found at the crime scene appeared to be Lindsay's last response to Sean's ominous notes. There were two breakup letters to Sean that had been ripped up and were on the floor of the bedroom next to the body. She wrote to Sean to let him know that she was going to marry Aaron and that she was in love with him and that he didn't need to contact her or Aaron anymore. Lindsay even threatened to obtain a restraining order against Sean, but she never got a chance to send that letter. Investigators know Sean was in jail on the eve of her death, so they wanted to find out if Sean possibly could have had the means financially to hire someone on the outside to commit the murder. The investigators' sources indicated that Sean was pretty much pleading with Lindsay and his mother for money to survive while he was in prison. I ain't have no money to buy a pen card, I only to call my family. Did you lower? Yeah. This line of questioning quickly hits a dead end. Detectives do not believe that Sean had the capabilities of hiring a hitman, especially with his financial situation. There was no evidence whatsoever that Sean was involved in any way. With Sean no longer a suspect, police revisit what they know about the night of Lindsay's death. Aaron told police that he had been staying at a co-worker's house. Lindsay went to the co-worker's house that night and they had an argument there. Detectives look at the text messages within Lindsay's phone and found that she had been concerned about Aaron stepping out of their relationship. Turns out, in the weeks leading up to her death, Lindsay and Aaron's relationship had hit a rough patch. Aaron had briefly moved out of the house and in with Monica Dorsey, a co-worker of theirs. And that move had aroused Lindsay's suspicions. Lindsay believed that there was some kind of affair going on between the two of them. Detectives look into Monica Dorsey as a suspect. Monica is a 24-year-old single mother of four who has a reputation for being flirtatious. Lindsay's sister Simony also worked with Aaron and Monica at Logan's Roadhouse, making it easy for her to keep an eye on them for Lindsay. She saw Aaron and Monica get touchy-feely with each other and she reported that back to Lindsay. So now there are two love triangles, with three of the four working at the same place. It's a recipe for disaster. According to Simony, Lindsay had hurt Aaron really badly by talking to Sean and she really wanted to make things right with him, but she didn't have the time to because he was cheating on her with another woman. On the night of Lindsay's death, the situation escalated. Simony had been working that night with both Aaron and Monica at the restaurant. She began texting Lindsay. She had seen Aaron and Monica walk outside together for a break and they had come back in together, so she let Lindsay know. At 10.16pm, Lindsay texted Simony again. Simony told her that she loved her for the last time and Lindsay told Simony that she loved her too. Three hours later, Lindsay was dead. Investigators continue to piece together what happened during Lindsay's last few hours alive. They believe Monica has some answers. Monica Dorsey was invited to come down to the station. The detectives ask her about Aaron. Are you on couple or? I mean, it's not official. It's not like it's been like, but are we dating? I mean, yeah, I mean, has he been staying at my house? There's something there. The detective then asks her about Lindsay. Have you ever had any issues with her? Words, absolutely. She's been watching us get home every single night and stalking us. Then he asked her about the night of Lindsay's death. Sunday, she, um, showed up at the house and we were getting in the car and she followed us. He lived in the f out. You guys are gonna regret this. Everything you go though is gonna be ruined. Then he asked her about the night of Lindsay's death. So we drove to work. She called him. What time did you to drive to work? We had both had to be there at five. So it was literally, we were probably four minutes away from work and she called him. He answered and he's like, aren't you supposed to be at work? And she's like, no, I'm not going in. I'm gonna kill myself. I swear to God, I'm gonna kill myself. So I'm gonna kill myself. Oh, I heard the whole entire thing. Monica's demeanor was calm and she was confident in the statement she provided to detectives. Did you say why she was gonna kill herself? Because she wants to be with him, but their relationship has been done. But no gun was found at the crime scene. Was Lindsay killed to make room for Monica? So we get to work and work is fine. We get off work. What's to make it all? Um, probably like, so 10.04 is when we got off work, when we were walking out to the car. And then we 
Go back to my house. Then around midnight, Lindsay showed up outside of Monica's house. Lindsay had honked the horn to get his attention, to confront Aaron for being there. According to Monica, Aaron went outside, briefly talked to Lindsay, and returned to the house with troubling news. He was like, I'm sorry, he was like, I gotta go um, handle this. I'm just gonna give her the closure she needs, call her down, and I'll be back. Did he say what type of closure he was gonna give her? Just it. They were really done, and that there'd never be a them again. Although Monica reveals her dislike for Lindsay, nothing in her account of what happened that night connects her directly to the murder. But Monica's interview is significant for another reason. It pokes a gaping hole in one key part of Aaron's story. Aaron told police that he and Monica were not in any kind of sexual relationship or any kind of relationship other than co-workers. After interviewing Monica, the detectives continue to talk to Aaron. He needs proof that Aaron is lying about his relationship with Monica. Aaron gave the detective the impression that he and Lindsay were still in a relationship, and also led him to believe that he wouldn't have any type of motive for taking her life. The detective isn't buying it. You can't lie, man. It's a homicide investigation. I can't confess to something I didn't do. I'm going to get Aaron agrees to take a computer voice stress test. But the only way to pass this test is to be 100% honest with me. Okay, were you present when Lizzie was shot? No. Is this the month of December? Yes. Did you shoot Lindsay? No. There were signs of deception. If you failed this test, there's no way to answer buts about that. The detective tells Aaron the two crucial questions that show deception. Were you present when Lindsay was shot? Did you shoot Lindsay? He presses Aaron to tell the truth. You didn't find Lindsay like that, did you? Faced with the evidence of his lies, Aaron's story changes once again. There were many different stories that he had told police on what happened that night. This time, Aaron places himself inside the house when Lindsay was shot. I was just about to the kitchen when I heard the gunshot. I yelled her name and ran into the room. Then Aaron reveals another stunning detail. Aaron admitted that there was a second gun involved. Aaron already told investigators about the gun he hid in Lindsay's yard three weeks prior, the one that proved not to be the murder weapon. Now he admits to knowing about a second gun. What did it look like? Silver and black? Aaron claims that after he heard the gunshot and found Lindsay dead, he panicked and grabbed the gun that was still in the house. He then ran down the street and dumped that weapon in a nearby field. Where do I do it this way? Towards, this? Towards, towards the trees. Officers are sent out in search of the weapon. Whose gun was it? I don't know. Eventually, Aaron crumbles under pressure and tells police that he bought the gun a few days before the murder. What made you take the gun? Where did you just call us? Why not just leave it there? I'm on probation. I just freaked out. As detectives continue to interrogate Aaron, police recover the second gun in the field behind a liquor store. After recovering the weapon, it was sent to the Indiana State Police Lab, where it was tested and later confirmed to be the murder weapon. Finding the gun and the fact that Aaron admitted that he had taken the gun from the scene was a turning point. In the minds of law enforcement at that point, Aaron Toller was a suspect in the homicide of Lindsay Wilkins. The next step was to wait for the autopsy result. On December 9, 2016, prosecutors are preparing to formally charge Aaron Toller with murder. Then, a shocking twist in the case changes everything. At the conclusion of the autopsy, the pathologist made a determination that the death of Lindsay was a suicide. This was a massive blow to the case against Aaron. The Madison County Prosecutor's Office had never prosecuted a murder case where the pathologist didn't rule it as a homicide. Fortunately, one of the detectives on the case began digging into Aaron's past and made a significant discovery. Aaron Toller had previous restraining orders from past relationships. They were pretty fierce with violent allegations. The detective immediately contacted the chief deputy prosecutor and gave his opinion on the evidence and interviews that he had conducted, that he strongly believed that it was a homicide. After reviewing all of the facts, the lack of a gun at the scene and Lindsay's daughter being inside the house, the decision was made to go forward with a murder charge. On December 14th, 2016, the day of Lindsay's funeral, Aaron is charged with her murder. But the prosecution is up against all odds with the suicide ruling still standing. The investigation doesn't end until the trial begins. So all the way up until trial, they were investigating. During that time, in a murder case in Indiana, the defendants are not allowed to have bail, so Aaron was in jail the entire time. And while he's in jail, Aaron talks. A lot. 
One inmate tells police that Aaron admitted to shooting Lindsay and that he tried to make it look like a suicide. Aaron had confessed to trying to force pills down Lindsay's throat during an altercation with her. Another inmate recounts the conversation he had with Aaron when Monica visited the prison. They actually saw her walking outside and they talked about how fine and well-built she was. And Aaron made the comment, I killed for her. This was important information for the trial because there were two separate inmates that Aaron had confessed to. But the most damning new piece of evidence comes from Aaron himself when he consents to a polygraph test as both sides agreed that the results would be admissible in court. In his latest account, Aaron claims that he was with Lindsay as she drove home from Monica's house, and that the rest of his story is drastically different from his other past accounts. There was Tylenol pills on the floor. I had uh, two guns at the time. Um, she ended up grabbing the 9mm, and I was standing in front of her, and I was telling her, like, you can't be doing anything stupid, you need to go to bed. And about that time, she goes, no, I'm not living without you. And then that's when she shot herself. There was a 1% chance that Aaron was being truthful during his interview, meaning that he failed the polygraph. In July of 2018, over a year after Lindsay's death, Aaron goes on trial for her murder. But getting a conviction is still a long shot as the pathologist still listed the manner of death as a suicide. Lindsay's mother, sister, and even her young daughter, Serenity, testify. The jury also hears from law enforcement regarding Aaron's inconsistent accounts in the jailhouse informant's admissions. But when the pathologist takes the stand, the prosecution faces their biggest hurdle, the suicide ruling. The prosecutor asked the pathologist if he was aware of differing pieces of evidence and things that had happened since the crime had occurred. The pathologist says he didn't know about the failed polygraph, Aaron's changing statements, or the two guns. The prosecutor then asked him if he would have changed his manner of death had he known about the evidence at the time he conducted the autopsy. He indicated yes, that he would have ruled it as undetermined rather than a suicide. Everybody in the courtroom was looking around at each other, eyes wide open, like what just happened. But no one is more stunned than the defense. This was their defense strategy, that this was a suicide and that the expert pathologist ruled it a suicide. That would be reasonable doubt in and of itself. The pathologist's reversal is a major victory for the prosecution's case. After deliberating for just two hours, the jury comes back with their decision. They find Aaron Toller guilty of murder. Although only Aaron knows for sure what happened that night, the chief prosecutor believes that Aaron and Lindsay fought about Monica. And when they got to Lindsay's house, it escalated into a fight that included Sean. He believes that Aaron made her write the torn up letter. She decided that she was not going to send it. She might have even been the one that ripped it up. That infuriated him and they got into an altercation. During the altercation, the pills were scattered on the floor. Then he took the gun out and put it to her head and shot and killed her. He panicked then at that point and his first instinct was, I just shot somebody, I need to get rid of the gun. Then he called 911 lying and crying about what had just happened and tried to make it up as a suicide. But Aaron made one big mistake. Had he just left the gun there, this case would have never been prosecuted. He almost got away with murder. Aaron is given the maximum sentence of 70 years, 